the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Hebrews chapter 6. We're, we're going to be looking at uh, one of the most difficult passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. Uh, matter of fact, I, I can tell you unequivocally, I've had more discussions from Hebrews 6 probably than any other passage of Scripture in all of the Bible. I've had more people ask me questions about Hebrews 6 most likely than any other passage. I've been dealing with this probably for over 60 years in my life um, and, and just different levels of my journey um, that this has come up. Um, it, it's it's um, one of the obscure passages in all of the Word of God. And uh, one of the things that you're, you know about me is when we're going through the Bible, I'm not going to avoid those difficult passages. Now, there are about four different interpretations to chapter 6. We're going to be looking today at verses 4 through 12. And there are about four different ways that people interpret this passage. Some people would say that these are saved people who lost their salvation. And if you read it like it reads, and if you believe like they believe then you come to the conclusion that they can never be saved again. That it becomes impossible. Then there's a second uh, interpretation is that these are unsaved people who got to the very brink of salvation, got to the very edge of salvation, and they didn't go on in with Christ, but fell away, and they too would never, ever have another opportunity to be saved. And then there's a theoretical kind of interpretation uh, that doesn't hold water either because uh, what they, what their, their conclusion and their premises don't match up. It, you can't take the premises that they lay out and arrive at the conclusion that is drawn in the Word of God. And then there is the fourth interpretation that these are saved people who fall away not from salvation, but fall away from fellowship with Christ. And they get so far away from Christ that it then becomes humanly impossible for us to reach them, to bring them back, and leaves them at the point that only the Holy Spirit of God can ever get them back. That is the interpretation that I hold. Now, um, I had some guests that came and came to the guest reception room a little bit earlier and I said, you know, I was a little bit different today uh, because it was more of a teaching time than it was anything else. And, and, and we're going to be a classroom. I want to teach. I want you to be the students and I want you to get a piece of paper and a pencil because some of this stuff I don't want you to ever forget. I want you to hold on to it. Now, the first thing, and we'll get into the text in a minute, but the first thing that I want you to see, I believe that these are believers because the context confirms it. The context confirms it. Now, hear me a minute. Y'all listening? Look this way just a minute before you get to reading the scripture. Look this way. An obscure passage of scripture should never ever overshadow or take away from the biblical interpretation of a doctrine that is laid out across the board. It should never do that. And yet we watch people periodically they will lift out a verse or they'll lift out a couple of verses and they will seek to make it mean what they think that it means to the biblical misinterpretation of what everything else in the Word of God. For instance, eternal security. Eternal security is a doctrinal truth and you can't take a, a passage of Scripture and make it mean that you can be saved today and lost again without the expense of what the whole Bible is talking about. Somebody said that 
text without context is pretext. If you go back to verses 1 through 3, you, it, it becomes real clear that he's talking to believers because he said, I want you to get off of the milk. Now, who's on the milk? Lost people are not on milk. Unbelievers are not on milk. So he's clearly communicating with believers. I want you to get off the milk and I want you to get onto the meat of the word of God. I want you to go on to full maturity. And God will help you. So he's clearly speaking to believers at this point. Second thing I want you to see with me is that their description, the author's description confer of these people confirms that they are believers. Their description confirms they are believers. Pick it up now and let's look what I'm talking about at verse 4. Here's the description. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Now, look with me, if you will, at the word enlightened. It means to be brought to the light. It means to come out of darkness and into the light. Go, go over to chapter 10 and look at verse 32 with me for just a minute. He says, but call to remem remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, after you were brought to the light, then you had these great afflictions. So he's talking here about people. Um, you, you remember in Corinthians 3, 3 through 6, um, Paul says that the God of this world, who is that? has blinded the eyes of them that they cannot see. Now, he's talking there about unbelievers. So these unbelievers have had their eyes open. They have been illuminated. They have been enlightened. And that occurred at the point of salvation. Now, notice the next little phrase. He says, tasted of the heavenly gift. Now, now what's the gift? The Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave what? His son. The gift is Jesus. He is our salvation. He is God's gift uh, to us. You say, well, preacher, now I can just prove to you right here, right now, that it's not believers that he's talking about. It's non-believers, and, and I can prove it to you by the little word that's in there called tasted, that they tasted of it. How many of you have ever been to Chewy's um, at Waverly, the Tex-Mex place at Waverly? Let me see your hand. I, mean, I D-double-dog dare you to go over there and try their Trace Leches cake. Have y'all ever eaten a Trace Leches cake from Chewy's? It, it's, it, it'll be on the tree when we get to heaven, I'm convinced. <laughs> But, but if, you ever, if you ever go there and you've got a friend and the friend says, I want a taste of the Trace Laces. And they get there for, I, I, don't want, I don't want to eat one. I just want to taste one. And they take their fork and 12 times <laughs> they, they've consumed it there. Taste is a very relative thing. You can go into some countries and they would say, okay, it's dinner time. Let's go in and taste the dinner. Well, he doesn't mean let's go sample the dinner. He says, let's, let's chow down big time here uh, at the meal. Now, now here, I don't, if you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this, okay? This word taste here is the same word that the writer uses in chapter 2 and verse 9. When the Bible says that Jesus tasted death for us did he just sample death for us no he took the whole thing on himself so so he, he's he's talking here 
uh, up about consuming. 500 people last year died by tasting poisonous things. Now notice what else he says. Who are partakers of the Holy Spirit. Who are partakers of the Holy Spirit. That, that means that the Holy listen, listen. It means that the Holy Spirit has come into their life. By the way, you don't get a little bit of the Holy Ghost here and a little bit of the Holy Ghost there. You get all of the Holy Spirit at one time. He does not come in parts. So you have all of him. You, you be, listen, non-believers don't have any of the Holy Spirit. Now they have some spirits, but they don't have the Holy Spirit. Notice he says, and tasted the goodness of of the word of God. That's a child of God that he's talking about there. He's talking about believers. Non-believers don't care anything about the word of God. And, and, and listen, I'm, I'm a perfect example of that. Uh, I remember one time when I was uh, five or six years old on the streets of Brevard, North Carolina, a street evangelist grabbed me by the arm, jerked me in an alley, and, and he started preaching to me and talking to me, you're going to die and go to hell. I didn't care what he had to say from that point on. I didn't want to hear it. I rejected that. When I was about 14 years old, somewhere along there, I went to church for another reason than to hear the word of God. I was sitting there minding my own business. The preacher gets down off of the platform, gets in the pew in front of me. I'm at the back of the church. He gets in the front pew in front of me and starts preaching down at me like I was the only one in the building. I didn't want to hear the word of God. My, one of my best friends in high school about 16 years old, uh, he, he was a great young man, loved Jesus with all of his heart, called to preach, still preaching today, but he was going to hold a crusade in our ballpark. And, and, and we played on the, on, the, on the basketball team together. We were great friends. He wanted me to come and hear him preach. I didn't care anything about the Word of God. Lost people don't care about the Word of God. Right. Believers love the Word of God. So he, here he's talking here. Uh, about believers because to unbelievers the word of God is a bitter pill that they don't want to swallow. Now, look what he says, tasted the powers of the coming age. Now, that's evident that what he's speaking of here is that obviously they had seen and been a part of the apostles' work uh, they had been partakers of the signs and the wonders and the healings, and many of them may have experienced it themselves, and they were affected by what the apostles had done. Now, let me give you number three. The term fall away is also proof positive and confirms that they are believers. Uh, watch this in verse 6. If they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance. Fall away from what? Now, I promise you, uh, you can come to my house for cube steak and gravy and mashed potatoes and homemade biscuits, cream corn, and some kind of dessert. If you can show me anywhere in the Word of God where the word of God says that you can be saved and lose your salvation. Ain't gonna happen. It's not there. It's not in the word of God. So from what did they fall? If they, did, if they couldn't fall from salvation, from what did they fall? Now I want you to notice with me, uh, if you will, the context that is here, I shared with you last week, is some Hebrew believers who began to drift away and wanted to get back into the Jewish tradition. They wanted to get back into Judaism. And he's talking here about the inertia that pulls them away, that causes them to fall away from their closeness to Christ. Their closeness to their walk with Christ. Now today... The context, if you were writing to us today, the context would be falling away from our sweet fellowship with Jesus. Not our position in Christ, but our fellowship with Christ. Big difference. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Once you start falling away from Christ and the nearness and the fellowship of Christ... 
things are going to get real complicated and real complex real quick. Look at the word uh, if there. If they fall away. It, it, you know, it's a bad interpretation to be honest with you. There, there's a conditional if that goes like this. If my wife were to give me $3,000 for me to go buy some New golf clubs. I would go buy me some new golf clubs. Now, I wonder what the chances of that are. You understand? That, that's conditional. If she gives them to me, uh, I, I'm going to go buy me some new golf clubs. This is not conditional here. I'm, I'm not getting an English class, but this is a present participle term. Not conditional term but an active term. It means to be in the process of falling away. Um, to already be moving toward falling away. He's talking here uh, of, of not about apostasy. There are a lot of people that talk about that, that, that it's apostasy. The fall away here doesn't translate as apostasy. That's the word apostasia. Here the term fall away is the word parapipto. And it means to veer, to steer from, or to move away from the beaten path for a season of time. To move away from the reality of our closeness with Christ. He is talking about believers who veer away from Christ who didn't forfeit their relationship, but they veered away from their fellowship. How many of you are married or have been married? Let me see your hand. Hold them up. Good night. Good night. Now, if you've been married for five minutes, you know that there are two different personalities that are coming together under the same roof to try to cohabitate, and it ain't always going to be smooth and easy. Can I get a witness from anybody in the house. I've had people tell me they've been married 40 years, 50 years, and have never had an argument. I look back at them and say, liar, liar, pants on fire. That just is not going to happen. You're going to have an argument somewhere along the way. When you do, would you agree that inside that house, suddenly it, there's a chill in the air? There's a coldness that shows up. And if there is some talking, it's really pretty sharp and can be harsh at times. Amen? So you decide, well, I'm not going to hang around here. I'm just going to take me a walk in the neighborhood. And so you get out and walking down the street in your neighborhood. You run across a neighbor and he says, are you still married? And you say, no, not right now I'm not. <laughs> That's not so. You are still married, but you're just not in fellowship right now. You, you could be if you quit being so stubborn and lose your ego and get in and repent, men, and ask God to forgive you and ask her to forgive you, everything would be better. Mm -hmm. I even heard some men say amen on that. You, you didn't break your relationship. You just veered off. You steered away. You moved away from the reality of the fellowship. Now, it's very important that you understand that fall away here doesn't mean that you lose the relationship. You just steered away from it. All right? Let me give you number four. It is impossible repentance that confirms these are believers. It is the term impossible repentance that also confirms these are believers. He doesn't say that it is impossible to restore them to salvation. We know that you can't lose your salvation, so he's not saying it's impossible to get back to salvation because you never left it to begin with. But what he is saying is that it's impossible to humanly effect them to repentance. What is so impossible? I think this is going to resonate with a lot of people in this room. How many of you um, have a loved one or an acquaintance or family member that once walked with God, served the Lord faithfully, loved Him, 
bore fruit that are now out in the world and they're serving self and they're far, 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 far away from God. You believe they're saved, but they're far, far, far from God. Let me hold, hold you hand up. Have you noticed that it is impossible for you to go speak to them and effect them to repentance? Took me a long time to get here. Took me a long time to get to that part, especially if that family member or that acquaintance or that loved one of yours in, is into full-blown sin. They are simply not interested in what you have to say. Yesterday, my wife and I went to the grocery store. I wanted to get in there, I wanted to get out. It's about 6.30, 7 o'clock, I was exhausted. I wanted to get home, get rested up, get a bite to eat, go to sleep so I could be ready for the day. And we were at the grocery store and she went one way and I went another because we wanted to really do it quick. We'd double our effort. Okay, so I go get what I was assigned to get and I'm looking for her so we could go to the checkout counter. I'm at back there where the cheese is and I look and she done cornered somebody over there next to the cheese. I thought, oh my, here we go. I was gonna duck and I did, I did. I, I ducked down an aisle, but it wasn't quick enough. She saw me. Mike, Mike. <laughs> but it was a God thing. Go over, and I was, she was speaking to some folks, and, and, and uh, she said, you, you remember my son? And I said, oh, yeah, I remember him real well. I remember him very well. She said, uh, do you know that he got really away from God? He got really out there. She called her husband's name and said, we couldn't do anything. So we couldn't, nothing we said made any difference. We, we talked to him till we were blue in the face and it just made no difference. And then suddenly one day he comes in at the church service and I can't remember exactly the term. I think she used the term dump truck, but he came down at the invitation and fell on the altar like a dump truck and you could hear it all over the building. And he wept. And he's never been the same since. You, you understand what, what the word's saying here is that there comes a time that you have people that are in your sphere of influence that they veer off and they fall away and they go so deep in sin and so far away from Christ that it becomes impossible for you humanly to bring them back. Is it impossible for them to come back? No. Why? Because only the Holy Spirit of God then has the power to get them to that point. Now, am I going to stop sharing my love? Am I going to stop praying? Am I going to stop encouraging? Absolutely not. But I have come to the conclusion that some people get so far away from God that I cannot affect their repentance. You cannot affect another person's repentance. Only the Spirit of God can do that. When they lose their family, when they lose their testimony, when they lose their fruit and the rug is jumped out from under them and they have nothing to lean on, it is the power of the Holy Spirit of God that then brings them to a place of repentance. I could name you man after man, woman after woman. I could name you family members even today. Let, let me give you number five. The illustration confirms that he's talking to believers. Watch this in verse seven. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. Now, here he is. He's saying, here's a piece of property, and the rain falls on that piece of property, 
parts of that spring up with lush fruit. And, and the same rain falling on the ground over here brings up briars and thorns. You, you hear this now. He's, he's giving us a major illustration that there are times in the Christian life that we steer away and stray away from God that brings barrenness into our life when we get into sin. Do you, do you see, now don't jump on that. Don't jump on the end of, what is that, verse 8 or 9? Which one was it? Um, burn, burn, burn. The latter part of verse 8. Says that is to be burned. See there, preacher, it means they're going to die and go to hell. No, that's not what he's talking about. It's a reference here to 1 Corinthians, the third chapter. You know, he's talking there in that third chapter about the Bema seat of Christ. When Christians will appear before Christ and give an account for what we have done as a child of God. And he says, take heed. Be aware, be careful of what building materials you use to build your life on. He gives six building materials, wood, hay, stubble, and then gold and silver and precious stones. If you build your life with things of the self and things of the world, the wood, hay, and the stubble, he says that this heavenly blowtorch is going to show it all for us to see what we have done with our life and that which we have sown to the flesh is going to be burned up completely in the fire. But that which we have done for the Lord with the gold and the silver and the precious stones, we will be rewarded for that to be able to lay at the feet of Jesus. I don't care anything about rewards. I just want to serve Jesus. Well, you ought to be concerned about rewards. God's concerned about rewards and you ought to be too. If any man's work be burned, he says, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Amen. I want to tell you what, it'd be a sad state of affairs to get into heaven and to have absolutely nothing to show for your life. That's the reference that he is making to here in the first Corinthians, the third chapter, that is to be burned. Now, let me give you this one. In the last few verses now, he gives an encouraging appeal. Verse 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you've so, shown uh, toward his name, in that you've ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not lazy or slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Here's the encouraging word that he's giving. Here's the influence. He's saying to believers here, I want you to stay faithful to the very end. I want you to count the cost. I want you to pay the price. I want you to be consistent followers of Jesus until such time that God calls you home. Powerful word there. Now, now let me ask you a question. What is the application of this text? Is it simply just to prove a theological accuracy that my belief is stronger than somebody else's belief and the basis of my belief is more accurate? No, that's not it whatsoever. But let me just tell you what it is. It is to show us all that none of us ought to be playing footsie with sin. I told you at the beginning of Hebrews that there were five warnings in the Bible, in, in the book of Hebrews. This is the third warning that started in chapter five. It will continue through chapter six. And the warning is simply, 
if you dabble in sin, if you leave the fellowship of Christ and you go so far, you're going to cross over a precipice. And when you cross over that precipice, you're going to get into an area of life that it becomes humanly impossible for anybody to go after you. And the only way that you will ever get back into a right relationship with God is for the Holy Spirit of God to do it. That's the warning. It means you get into a place that God's word says you are crucifying afresh and anew the Lord Jesus Christ and dishonoring God, losing your family, destroying your testimony, ceasing to bear any fruit. Many, many, many years ago, I had a deacon that I loved with all of my heart. He and I were extremely close. Great Bible teacher. Had a powerful Sunday school class. We fellowshiped together, vacationed together. Played golf together. We had a deal between the two of us. We had a pact. About every time we were together, we uh, reminded each other of the pact. I'd say to him, if I get out there, you better come get me. He'd say back to me, if I get out there, you better come get me. And if I didn't bring it up, he would. If I get out there, you better come get me. That powerful friend, full of Jesus, drifted a little bit here, drifted a little bit there. And before I even knew it, he was gone. As soon as I found out about it, I found out where he lived. He left his wife left his family, left his church, left his friends, left me. I went to his hotel room, caught him there one day. Wouldn't even look me in the eye. I said, I told you I'd come get you. I told you I'd come get you. I talked to him about repenting. I talked about restoring I talked to him about getting right with God, repenting of his sin, going back to his family. He wouldn't even look at me and cared absolutely nothing about what I said. Nothing. As far as I know, he's still out there, unrepentive. Lost his family, lost everything, lost everything. I'm telling you, friend, you need to be careful. Are you, are you dabbling in some sin right now? Are you experimenting with some sin? Are you yielding to some level of temptation and maybe tasting? what that sin is like and a little bit today and a little bit yesterday and a little bit the day before you edged a little closer moved a little closer and a little closer to that line and if you're not careful you're going to go so far that nobody's going to be able to help you but God I'm making an appeal to you as your pastor this morning. Come back while you can. Come back while you can. What's that old saying we've had for a number of years? Sin will take you further than you intended to stray. 
Sin will keep you further than you intended to stay. Sin will cost you more than you're willing to pay. And in Jesus' name, come back to him while you may. Would you stand with us? Let's pray together. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.